just by showing you a really short uh, video that I took from YouTube that shows the expansion of the Russian Empire from its origins as a small principality around the city that's now Moscow and into the areas of Siberia, Central Asia, and the Caucasus. So you'll just have to bear with me on the corny music and focus on the expanding red. Okay, so this expanding red is the area that I'm going to focus on in my talk today. And when we look at the expansion of these red lines into the territory of Eurasia, um, it's easy to assume that the Russian Empire just expanded into a vacuum, but of course that's not true. People were living there, lots and lots of different people from varying ethnic and religious backgrounds. And uh, we can also think, when we look at this expanding red line, exactly what the expansion of the red line means. Um, it means the gradual introduction of Russians, settlers, both voluntary and not so voluntary, military forces, missionaries, educators, traders, and most importantly, Russian exiles and prisoners, among them some very well-known writers. Um, these Russian writers who interacted with and were inspired by local Russian local writers and their cultural traditions, um, they were uh, not only did this moment of cultural exchange produce some of the greatest works in Russian literature, but it also spurred the development of na national literary traditions in Central Asia and the Caucasus. Uh, and today I'm going to introduce you to some of these writers who later became founding fathers of these national non-Russian literary traditions. Uh, and we're going to start with a very productive and fascinating exchange. Uh, take a look at this letter, and I'm going to see if anybody can guess which Russian writer uh, wrote this and to whom. Uh, you write to me that you love me, and I tell you without ceremony that I have fallen in love with you. Never, not to anybody, not even to my own brother, have I felt such an attraction as I do to you, and God only knows who has how this has come about. Any ideas? Oh, okay, Dostoevsky, uh, absolutely. Fyodor Dostoevsky's zealous declaration of love written during his nine year period of imprisonment and forced military service in Siberia had a most unusual recipient, the Kazakh geographer, ethnographer, and translator Chokhan Valikhanov. The two met initially in the Russian city of Omsk, where Valikhanov completed his military education in the Omsk Cadet Corps and later served uh, for the Russian governor general of Western Siberia. They carried on a correspondence through the 1850s and 1860s as Valikhanov's intelligence gathering expeditions to the exotic frontier of the Russian Empire's Central Asian territories captivated the Russian popular imagination. Dostoevsky's letters to Valikhanov reveal his fascination with the intellectual promise of the young officer and scholar, but they also impart the paternalistic attitudes and anxieties inherent in the Russian Empire's longstanding encounter with Central Asia. In the same 1856 letter, Dostoevsky urges Valikhanov to spend the next several years com completing his education in Russia and Europe, uh, quote, so that you may become extremely useful to your native land, end quote. He continues by stressing Valikhanov's unique obligation to act as an intercessor between his people and the Russians. This passage finds Dostoevsky enacting a familiar colonial discourse in which the colonizer dictates the terms of the colonized subject's inclusion into the imperial world, a noble goal, a, ho a holy task. He delineates the subject's weighty responsibilities as an intermediary between the two cultures, most crucially to provide the empire with useful knowledge about its subject populations and environs the first of your people to explain to Russia what the steps are and their significance and you people in relation to Russia. Dostoevsky simultaneously stresses the subject's exceptionality, enlightened, he calls him the enlightened and the first European educated Kyrgyz. Uh, but he also stresses the ultimate inferiority of this position. Uh, and here it's the, nece the necessity of a plea with the Russians on behalf of his native land. Uh, and in the end, he even takes the liberty of bestowing humanity upon the subject, a soul as well as a heart. Uh, 
And here's where it really gets interesting. Uh, despite the presumptions of Dostoevsky's rhetoric, the relative positions of power that he and Balikhanov occupied in imperial Russian society were actually, in a way, the opposite of what we might have, uh, assume and what this rhetoric might suggest. At the time Dostoevsky wrote the letter, he had recently completed a prison sentence in Omsk. He was a, he was a prisoner in exile. Uh, echoing the previous generation of Russian writers in exile, whose ranks include uh, Alexander Pushkin and Mikhail Lermontov, some of the most revered figures of all time in Russian literature, uh, Dostoevsky likewise fell victim to the autocratic efforts of the Tsar to penalize any form of real or perceived dissent. Valikhanov, on the other hand, was a free man, an officer, and a member of one of the most politically powerful aristocratic families of Central Asian steppe society. So by virtue of this seemingly typical but altogether unconventional relationship, the written record of mutual admiration and mentorship between these two writers uh, forms an apt metaphor for the complex interrelationship of Russian and non-Russian peoples within the Russian Empire. Uh, so inspired by this moment, uh, I'm going to give you some more examples in this talk of, this, of the dynamics of cultural exchange in the Russian Empire's Muslim frontier. And first we're going to start with the Russian side of the encounter, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the other side of the encounter. So in addition to Dostoevsky, uh, two of the best known Russian writers found themselves also in exile for their perceived political descent, uh, Alexander Pushkin and Mikhail Lermontov. And you can see they were born and died within just a few years of one another. Uh, Lev Tolstoy also served in the military in the Caucasus in his youth. And this was an experience that shaped many of his later works of literature, including his late career masterpiece, uh, Haji Murat. So Alexander Pushkin's initial stint of political exile led him on an inadvertent tour of the Caucasus in 1820. Uh, the poet's initial confrontation with seemingly exotic Caucasian peoples and locales resulted in an astonishing poetic output uh, that became a touchstone, if not a direct template, for all subsequent literary representations of the region in the Russian tradition. Traveling with a volume of Lord Byron's works in tow, Pushkin depicted Russia's new frontier with little attention to accuracy. Uh, instead, he tailored Western Europe's romantic image of the Orient to, spit, to fit the specifics of the Russian colonial situation. Uh, so as you can see in this uh, excerpt from one of his works, the Caucasian landscape's topographical extremes, grim Mount Beshtau, for example, uh, made it an ideal stand-in for Byron's alpine scenes. And when combined with the region's enigmatic warlike inhabitants, this made the Caucasus a site of great beauty, but also great terror, uh, which in the parlance of romanticism is known as the sublime. And there's actually been a number of really interesting scholarly works uh, on this aspect of uh, Pushkin and other Russian writers' um, depiction of these frontiers. Uh, so the Russian part of this encounter is already well-worn territory in our field. So for Pushkin, as well as the subjects of his poems, traveling uh, to such a place provided an exhilarating experience of freedom uh, as they outran the stifling uh, expectations of Russian society and the very real political constraints that had driven them to the Caucasus in the first place. In this way, beyond provoking spiritual and aesthetic preponderances, the Caucasus also serves as the site of social critique, uh, where the fierce and free Caucasians are imagined as noble savages and their presence holds up a mirror to the hypocrisies of Russian polite society, and in some works even questions the logic of imperial conquest. Uh, as in Pushkin's famous poem, Prisoner of the Caucasus, shown here, uh, foiled or star-crossed love affairs between Russian interlopers and Caucasian women provide an erotic dimension to the thrilling colonial encounter, while projecting imperial ambiguities onto the frame of gender relations. The sensual and sensational 19th century Russian writing on the Caucasus is also tempered by a sense of obligation on the part of the writers. Uh, in this case, acknowledging the reality of participating in a civilizing mission coupled with the anxieties of competing with both European and Asian empires uh, for geopolitical dominance. An often quoted letter uh, of, from Pushkin to his brother in 1821 provides an illustration of the difficulties of representing and evaluating this issue in writing. Uh, 
So he writes, he describes Caucasian as the sultry border of Asia with savage Circassians that is gradually being tamed by Russia and might even inspire Russia to um, fulfill some of Napoleon's failed plans of conquering Asia. In the work of Pushkin and his contemporaries, a link to European romanticism via the orientalization of a southern frontier serves to reify Russia's emerging identity as a European imperial power. Uh, scholars Monica Greenleaf and Stephen Moeller Sally conclude that the ideology with which the Russian Empire conquered its contiguous outlying territory was predicated by the Russians' own deep-seated memory of their centuries-long conflicts with neighboring non-Russian peoples as well as the Russians' own sense of uh, backwardness and inferiority in comparison with Western Europe. Several scholars, oh, whoops, several scholars of Russian literature succinctly illustrate this point by quoting Dostoevsky once again. Uh, Dostoevsky wrote, uh, in Europe we are hangers-on and slaves, whereas in Asia we should go as masters. In Europe we were Tatars, whereas in Asia we too are Europeans. Our mission, our civilizing mission in Asia will bribe our spirit and drive us to there. Uh, so now let's return to the colonized, the local writers who lived and wrote in the midst of the Russian incursion into their lands. Uh, how exactly did they respond to these discourses? Uh, so during this incursion, the Russians began training native cadres who, as translators and bureaucrats, would facilitate Russian rule. Instrumental in this process was the rapid establishment of Russian language schools, which eventually displaced centers of Islamic learning uh, in many parts of the empire. The appearance of the Russian language, Russian institutions, and Russian intellectuals in the newly colonized areas shaped the ideological views and cultural orientation of local elites. Many of the writers who emerged from this environment were also advocates for learning Russian and for closer allegiance with the Russian Empire in the interest of transforming the societies and communities in which they were living. So uh, through an investigation of Western European literature and thought, which was primarily available to them in Russian translation, uh, local intellectuals such as Mirza Fatalia Hundov became advocates of democracy, social justice, and the development of a coherent national identity. And we can remember the nation is an idea that comes into Russia as well as into Russia's periphery from Western Europe through uh, works that were translated into Russian primarily. Uh, so people like Akhundov were also reformers, utilizing their positions of relative power in order to advocate for changes in local social, political, and religious practices. So today I'm going to talk namely about this guy, Mirza Fatali Akhundov, or Akhundzade, or Sabuhi, depending on which language you speak, uh, who was a Turkic Muslim writer touted in Europe as the Tatar Malie. Uh, but later garnered more serious renown in the Near East as an intellectual forebearer of both Azeri and Iranian nationalism. Akhundov's lifetime coincides with a great pe period of political and social upheaval in the South Caucasus as the Russian Empire reached the apex of its territorial expansion by annexing principalities that had previously been under Persian control. And that's the territory of what's now modern day Azerbaijan. Uh, he was born in a mountain city uh, and spent most of his life in the uh, Russian capital of the Caucasus, which is now Tbilisi, Georgia. He received a Shia clerical education in his early youth, so he, he was versed in the Quran and Islamic law as well as classical Arabic and Persian poetry. Uh, and then he joined his fate to the Russian Empire by enrolling in a Russian school and embarking on a secular career path. Uh, in 1834, he began working for the Russian chancellor, Chancellery in uh, Tbilisi, and he quickly attained fluency in Russian, and he eventually wound up teaching Turkish and Persian at the Tbilisi military school. Uh, he later joined the Imperial Russian Army as an instructor and translator of Oriental languages, and he rose to the rank of colonel in the Russian Imperial military before his death in 1878. Uh, so the environment in which he was working was a unique space of overlap between Persian, Russian, and pan-Islamic worlds. Uh, because he was in, employed within the institutional system of the Russian Empire and the Caucasus, he became one of a contingent of local intellectuals responsible for spreading Russian culture and advocating reforms within it. His use of language was similarly hybrid, uh, 
because he was educated in Arabic and Persian and composed in Persian, Russian, and later the language that would become uh, Azeri or Azerbaijani. And he was one of the people who was instrumental in making it Azeri, Azerbaijani. So in this multicultural environment, he fraternized with Georgian, Armenian, Russian, Turkic intellectuals. And he also made the acquaintance of uh, two well-known Russian writers who were members of the, um, the revolutionary group, the Decembrists, who had been exiled to the Caucasus, like Pushkin and Lermontov before them. Uh, and Akhundov himself also had connections to Pushkin and Lermontov through these, through the, these circles. So he's best known for some plays, some comedic plays, which is the reason he's known as the Tatar Molière in Western Europe. Um, and these plays mark the ascendance of the Azeri language as a legitimate idiom for literature, as well as a medium for social critique. Um, these works are also, in essence, multilingual, uh, because they were published in Russian before they ever were staged or appeared in the Azeri language. And uh, at the same time, by Akhundov's own assertion, his intended audience for these plays was his own community of Muslims. And this message was one singularly focused on modernization. By satirizing entrenched customs and beliefs, particularly traditional gender roles, religion, and the unjust power of local leaders, Akhundov's plays chastised what he saw as the conservative excesses of local Islamic society. Uh, for example, one play features a despotic Khan marrying a young girl against her will. Uh, another, the plot of another play revolves around the comedic juxtaposition of rural Islamic society and the enlightened yet decadent culture of Westerners. Uh, Akhundov's works, influenced by the Russian writers Gogol and Grybayedov, as much as by uh, Voltaire, Moliere, and Shakespeare, provided a platform for his strong advocacy of enlightenment and reason. Uh, moreover, his work had its own ramifications beyond Russian-occupied Transcaucasia. Um, the Persian translations of his plays took on considerable significance in Iran, and uh, these plays were also staged in the Soviet era, and even as late as the 1950s, they were being staged in Afghanistan for similar purposes in order to promote modernization and enlightenment values. Uh, though he achieved these successes in the 1850s, uh, I want to talk about Akhundov's early writing career, uh, which began two decades later, touched off by a watershed event that shook the Russian literary establishment to its core. And that's the 1837 death of Alexander Pushkin in a duel with a fellow hot-headed Russian aristocrat. When Mikhail Lermontov's controversial poem about these events, uh, which at the time was unpublishable uh, due to censorship in the Russian Empire, it was not able to be published, it was only circulated among local intellectuals, among Lermontov's friends and associates. Uh, once, this poet, once this poem reached the circles of the intelligentsia in uh, the Caucasus, Akhundov immediately set out to write his own poetic eulogy of Pushkin. The resulting work, which is commonly referred to in Russian as uh, the Oriental poem, Vastochna Poema, is considered a landmark work of modern Azeri literature. And it's certainly one of the first high profile Russian language works by a Turkic author. Uh, but describing it as just a Russian language work is a little bit too simple. In fact, Akhundov composed the original text in Persian, uh, did not publish it in Persian until much later. Uh, this was just a manuscript that was found after his death. Uh, the first Russian version appeared in a Moscow-based journal, the Moscow Observer, in 1837. Uh, it was reprinted several times afterwards. Uh, this is. Uh, an image of one of the subsequent reprintings from 1874. Um, this version contains a subtitle identifying Akhundov as a contemporary Persian poet, as well as a detailed commentary on the poem's significance in the Persian literary tradition and the Muslim culture in general. So this is when it's published in a Russian journal, it contains this background information. 
further contributing to this framing, an extensive editorial footnote explains the curious circumstances by which this remarkable Persian poem, uh, together with a Russian translation made by the poet himself, arrived uh, on the journal's pages. The editor's note includes the full text of a letter by a Russian Orientalist, presenting Akhundov as the representative of a distant tribe whose wild enigmatic nature, uh, exemplified by the Arabic script of the original Persian text, bleeds through into a clumsy Russian language poem. Uh, so the original was written in Arabic script. I'm sure that the savagery and wildness in some places will be excused due to the spirit of the East. Uh, in so much as, as it is the opposite of the European spirit. Um, I thought it necessary to preserve the bright local color of Iran. Uh, the letter that accompanies this uh, publication also frames the poem as a testament to the success of Russia's civilizing mission in Transcaucasia. Uh, this letter assures the reader of Akhundov's loyalty uh, as well as the great impression that Pushkin left on him, as well as his willingness to be tamed by Russian culture. Uh, so in a country where powerful nature lavishes its splendor and wealth among a tribe still oppressed by the yoke of wild passions, this new civic consciousness is the gradual taming of the turbulent forces of hostile human nature, abor uh, abundantly pouring out the gifts brought about by Russia. Uh, we see in Akhunda such a sympathy for Russian education. Uh, so in spite of this supposed sympathy that's stressed in the note accompany accompanying Akhunda's poem, the poem itself, its rhetorical and formal makeup, owes far more to the poet's early education in the traditions of classical Arabic and Persian literature. Uh, several critics note that Akhundov's original text adhered to the classical Near Eastern court genre of the Qasida, and I am not pronouncing that correctly, I'm sure of it, uh, so I hope the Persianist will help me out here, uh, which originated in Arabic poetry, then thrived in the Persian, Ottoman, Turkish, and Urdu traditions, uh, and typically took the form of a long panegyric ode in praise of the poet's patron. Julie Scott Misami adds that the Persian Qasida was the courtly poem par excellence because it sim simultaneously functions as a celebration, homage, and gift presented by the poet to his prince and ensures the enduring fame of both the ruler it praises and of the poet who is its maker. So let's take a look at the poem itself. Um, the Russian version that was printed first in 1837 comprises 51 unrhymed lines with no identifiably Russian metrical structure. And those of you who have studied Russian poetry know that meter, metrical structure, is a really big deal in Russian poetry. It's very unusual that there would be a poem printed without that. Um, the first section finds the poet meditating on Pushkin's death as a personal loss, which is enacted through the dialogue between the poet and his own heart. In the midst of a springtime garden's fertile bloom, the poet finds his heart stricken mute with grief and demands to know the reason for such unreasonable silence. Uh, so now why do you grieve and despair like a mourner at a funeral? So the poet is asking himself this. Why are you so sad? The second section of the poem uh, consists of the poet's heart, the, the heart of the poet uh, personified, giving an astonished and passionate reply as it addresses the poet in a series of rhetorical questions. Um, and so this is the second part of the poem where the heart is speaking back to the poet. Really, you ignorant of the world, have you really not heard about Pushkin, head of the Assembly of Poets, of that Pushkin who in a hundred ways received praise to the ends of the earth, of that Pushkin to whom paper longed to lose her whiteness, if only his pen would leave a mark upon her face. So here he employs the metonymy of the body in order to convey the split subjectivity of a Persian-trained poet living at the edges of the Russian Empire. The heart, which is the seat of poetic talent, understands the significance of Pushkin, while the poet's mind remains ignorant to the world outside of the Caucasus. It is only through the heart's exhortations of Pushkin's greatness that the poet comes to understand the gravity of Pushkin's death. The heart goes on to eroticize Russian literature's con conquest through the metaphor of the paper longing to lose its purity to Pushkin's pen. The heart's 
reply to the poet extends through the poem's second section, so what you see here. But in the final four lines, um, Ahunda addresses Pushkin directly. And in doing so, this forms an overarching dialogue between Ahunda's own Near Eastern poetic heritage uh, and on the other hand, his newly acquired consciousness of the Russian poetic tradition, which builds into his sense of outrage at the injustice of uh, Pushkin's death. So um, in, the, in the final section, Akhunda positions Pushkin as the pinnacle of the Russian literary tradition. The light of his genius spread throughout Europe, uh, just like the new moon, which is a precious sign to the east. The glory of his genius spread throughout Europe, just like the might and greatness of Tsar Nicholas from China to Tatari. Comparing Pushkin's genius to the imperial power of Nicholas I is a particularly conspicuous gesture, especially in light of Pushkin's own very ambiguous relationship to Russian imperial power. After all, uh, his descent is what got him sent to the Caucasus in the first place. This comparison, far from signifying unequivocal support of Russian imperial power, reveals yet more complexities in Akhundov's poetic perspective. Although Tsar Nicholas's greatness and might might dominate the farthest expanses of Asia, from China to Tatari, Akhundov places it in a secondary place of importance by comparing the empire to Pushkin's genius, and not the other way around. In this nuanced simile, Pushkin becomes synonymous with progress and enlightenment, yet not entirely synonymous with Russia itself. Emphasizing this, Akhundov inscribes Pushkin's legacy onto a specific geographical place, not the center of the Russian Empire, Moscow, or the far reaches of China or Tatari, but in the Caucasus, uh, in the southern part of Russia, at the legendary fountain of Bakhchisarai which is uh, in the Crimea Peninsula, so not too far, just across the water from the Caucasus. By recasting some of the familiar tropes from Pushkin's own poetry about the Caucasus and imbuing them with agency, as well as equating his own words to theirs, Akhundov affirms the primacy of his own version of Pushkin and his own interpretation of Pushkin's work in contrast to the poet's legacy in mainstream Russian culture. Further, by referring exclusively to Pushkin's Caucasus works uh, and making the slain Russian poet into an object of observance by an Eastern subject from within the genre conventions of a non-Russian literary tradition, Akhundov is effectively domesticating Pushkin and his legacy. This is specifically evident in the poem's final line uh, when Akhundov, as the mouthpiece of the Caucasus, answers Pushkin using his own Persian pseudonym, Sabuhi. According to the literary scholar Leah Feldman, who does analyze the original Persian manuscript, um, signing a poem in this way is a conventional of classical Persian poetry. And in this particular instance, the signature seals the poem with an affirmation of uh, Akhundov's non-Russian identity. Additionally, by publishing a work like this in a, the Russian language, in a Russian journal in Moscow, Akhundov is answering Pushkin as a Persian, but in Pushkin's own language, thereby inserting his own perspective into Russian literature. The result is an unsettling fact. Even in affirming a non-Russian perspective and folding Pushkin into this non-Russian perspective, the poem is not wholly resistant to Russia. Uh, so this is evident in the hybridization of the Persian Gasada genre uh, upon the poem's translation into Russian, which Akhundov describes as a Gasada, but at the same time as an elegiac ode, uh, which is one genre that Pushkin was known for among many. Of no less importance is that Akhundov is also directly addressing his own people through the metonymic dialogue between the knowing heart and the ignorant mind in order to promulgate his pro-Pushkin, pro-Enlightenment views. Crucially, by positioning Pushkin as the apex of Russian literature's evolution, Akhundov upholds Pushkin's life and death as a measure of Russia's own troubled path towards progress. In this way, Russia comes into focus as a fellow Eastern culture, hostile to the forces of enlightenment with writers fulfilling a crucial role of upholding human values in the face of oppression. So in closing, I want to just briefly touch on what happened after this uh, 
incredibly productive time of cultural exchange between Russian writers and their non-Russian counterparts in the 19th century. Um, the effects of these connections are very much with us to this day. Writers like Chokhan Valikhanov and Mirza Fatalia Hundov are commemorated in many public spaces in the now independent nation states of Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan, uh, as you can see in this sculpture of Valikhanov and Dostoevsky in Kazakhstan and this uh, statue of Pushkin and another Kazakh writer he inspired, also in Kazakhstan. Valikhanov's face on Kazakh money, and uh, Akhundov's face on everything from postage stamps to uh, all kinds of memorabilia and public monuments in the country of Azerbaijan. Uh, so, these writers went on to inspire a subsequent generation of nationalist intelligentsia in the early 20th century who would go on to overthrow the czar and establish national literary traditions in the vernacular language, uh, which has become the foundation for the literary traditions and the national identities in uh, these parts of the world today. So thank you very much. Uh, I am really looking forward to discussing any of your questions that you might have. And that's all I gotta say. <laughs> <laughs>